he also did not have many people close to him in his life, and most people who knew him feared him. Right. So a lot of what might have once been truth about him has been warped into legend. But let's start at the beginning, or as he would say, le debut. <laughs> That's because this man, how you say, was French, Greg. Whoa! You already knew this. He was Basque, the big Basque, as he was uh, he was right. known as. He was born Michel Leonis, October 20th, 1822, in Combo Le Bon in the Southwest. South, so, sorry, uh, I lived in France for a while. We say Southwest. Uh, <laughs> so he, Combo Le Bon in the Southwest Basque country of France. Again, he's Gaston. Yeah. He was the son of a government official with nine siblings. He son had, of a government so, official. <laughs> He had green eyes. He was six foot four and, dare I say, full of muscles. Again, Gaston. Yeah. So wouldn't you know it, he was not a great guy. Again, he's Gaston. <laughs> he And he had a little friend uh, who did his taxes or something, but was also like his wingman. I don't uh, know. Yeah. He got involved with illegal ways of making money and his area being near the border with Spain. By age 20, he was leading a smuggling network between France and Spain. But he wasn't great at it because the government caught on. And supposedly, this is a lot of this is supposedly. Okay. Uh, he was questioned by some tax officials. Uh -huh. And when he didn't have the legal answers needed, he threw them off a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> he threw the answers off a cliff? Yeah, he took the forms and attached to those forms were a bunch of government tax <laughs> officials. <laughs> so supposedly he wow. threw a bunch of like poindexters that came from the yeah. French IRS. Now, either the shame of this whole nefarious endeavor or the Sh fact that he was now being hunted. Shame. But oh yeah, no, someone who does that feels shame. <laughs> no, no, no. The shame he brought his family. Oh, right, right, He right, did right. not feel shame. Okay. Or he was just being hunted by the cops or just because Miguel had to flee the country. But where to go? Around this time, the mid-1800s, a lot of Basques were coming to Los Angeles. The Basques are coming to town. They're Basques! They're Basques. <laughs> mid-18th century? No, mid-1800s. Oh, mid-1800s. Not, mid, not mid-18th century. I was very century. confused. Okay. They, they had originally come to California for gold, the Basques. Right. But once it became clear that the gold rush was coming to an end, many of them searched for different areas to apply their skills, which were in mining. One place they found was the beautiful, universally beloved... San Fernando Valley. Oh. The Basques are here. Colombo Town. Basque in the San Fernando. That that I'm gonna make a new postcard. Come Basque in the San Fernando Valley sun. That's cute. That requires a lot of explaining, but that's mm, cute. No, I think everybody understands the Basque history of the San Fernando Valley. Come tomato bisque in the center. Is that the same thing? I don't really know French. So the western parts of the valley of what is now Calabasas and beyond were, uh -huh. and I guess, and still are, I guess, rich with limestone. Therefore, a lot of the Basque gold miners came to the valley looking for work and became a pretty big population here circa 1854, which is when Miguel Leonis himself showed up in the valley. So they came to mine lime. Now the only limes you'll find in the valley, if you get a Los Toros, <laughs> if you get a margarita, drink a lime margarita or possibly a mojito. I guess that, yeah, I guess it's more of a mojito than Man. a margarita. I don't know. I'm not Charles Bukowski. I don't know what goes. Oh, my God. Oh, he loved margaritas. <laughs> margaritas. He <laughs> loved to party. Yeah. But I know you put lime in the coconut, but what do you put limestone in the coconut stone? And <laughs> And you mine it all up. You put the limestone in the coconut stone. You lime we're it all We're parody up. crazy today. We should be P22, which is now a verb. He uh, hit by a car or euthanized. Or have a statue built of us. A little bit of column A, a little <laughs> bit of column B. And none of column C. Yep. He seems to have come here because he knew there were other Basques around, uh -huh. but he himself got involved in something he knew how to do, which was sheep herding, which the valley was also great for right. sheep. So the man he got a job working for was named Joaquin Romero, who owned a bunch of land across the valley and beyond that used to be part of the San Fernando mission that had been given to him by the Mexican government. But we wouldn't be sitting here on Boxing Day talking about about Miguel Leonis if he was just a regular Basque guy who had thrown a few tax collectors off of a cliff. That's that's how you get into this country. The number of Basque guys who had thrown a few tax collectors off of a cliff that we don't talk about in this <laughs> show. So we're talking about Miguel Leonis because he was a lunatic and a dirtbag. Okay. Throwing people off of a cliff for a reason like that makes you a lunatic. I'll hear him out. <laughs> yeah. I'll, him I'll out. give him one more term. <laughs> I don't know if that makes him a lunatic. I'd like some more evidence of lunacy, please. <laughs> what? kind of tax collectors were they? What kind of cliff? Was it over the trampoline gorge? <laughs> so he wouldn't be content to just herd sheep for some guy in the valley, Miguel right. Leonis. He was an egomaniac. 
I put an exclamation point after. Yeah. I don't know. Why. He was an egomaniac. <laughs> He's an egomaniac. <laughs> maniac. <laughs> so Miguel Leonis wanted his own land. Nay, Greg. He wanted his own city. Nay, nay. He wanted his own country. Nay, nay, nay. He wanted his own empire. Oh my God. Miguel Leonis. Emperor Leonis. Emperor. He fancied himself. Of the San Fernando Valley. <laughs> of the dominion of Northridge. Yeah. All the way to Arlita. <laughs> all the way to Winnetka. So he fancied himself a king and even expressed to others that he had the goal of creating his own empire, okay. which is crazy. I mean, obviously that's insane. Yeah. But it also is not entirely weird considering this was 1854. And like, this was like loosely Los Angeles yeah. at the time. Yeah, I, I feel like, I mean, we don't have to talk about Game of Thrones too much, but like <laughs> the idea that like, so no one's really in charge of all this. Right. And if I'm aggressive and if I Boy. harness my lunacy enough. I think in House of the Incest Dragons, I think Miguel Leona should be a character. He should be a character. Because if that's what it's about, this guy fits in perfectly. perfectly. Yeah, yeah, like it makes like, you know, Empire's pushing it, but like, City? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Like it, this could What's a what's a name for another emperor other than like uh, mayor? <laughs> Comptroller. An emperor by any other name <laughs> would be just as uh, much of a dictator. <laughs> so to start all this though, he needed land. And it just so happened that the guy he worked for had land and it just so happened the guy he worked for was an alcoholic. Okay. Miguel took advantage of that and got his boss Joaquin Romero to sell him all of his land for cheap. So now Miguel Leonis owned a strip of land from around where Palmdale now is to either just in the north of Santa Clarita or the North Valley. Like, it was hard to tell where exactly his part of the land he owned now was. But this is why there's a part of that woodsy, canyony area north of Santa Clarita that's known as Leona Valley. It's oh. named after Miguel Leonis. Wow, really? And also why Miguel Leonis was allegedly there to beat up the monster of Elizabeth Lake. That was right. part of his land. okay. Which, if you don't recall from uh, one of our haunted episodes there was a monster it was the devil's pet that right. was like terrorizing people around elizabeth lake and one day miguel leonis came and beat it up and it left forever <laughs> a cartoonish story which part is cartoonish <laughs> again he fits into game of thrones he could have beat up the ice queen you is that a thing you almost had the you, ice he could have beat up the ice wall you're using a. Uh, it's like you have a dice with just words from Game of Thrones and you just read a sentence that it all made, like a Mad Libs. He could have beaten up the Northern Bleached Blonde. <laughs> But that wasn't enough for him. Now, as with almost everything involving this guy, there's two different versions of what happened next, but they're both about how he met a woman named Maria del Espiritu Santo as she was baptized on May 22nd, 1836 at the San Fernando Mission. But she's best known as Espiritu Chihuya, daughter of Juana Eusebra, who was Keech, and Odon or Odin Chihuya, who mm. was a Shumash leader. Okay. So she's the daughter of two different native tribes. Right. Uh, sort of, in a way, I guess not royalty, but like uh, leadership. Yeah, she's acclaimed. She's she's won a few awards. Yeah. Best daughter of two. Uh, yeah. But- <laughs> they, even back then, they had little Oscars that they would yeah. sell on along what is now Hollywood Boulevard, what was then Dirt. <laughs> and it says, two best daughter. The Dirt was really nice, though. And a lot of people <laughs> came from around the world to see the Dirt. Yeah. There were footprints in the Dirt, but they went away like after a day. Yeah. Mel Brooks has always been there, though. His, <laughs> yeah. his- Art somehow R2-D2's feet- <laughs> Always been there. Uh, so Espiritu lived on uh, 1,100 acres of land that covered pretty much all of West Hills, Calabasas, and part of Woodland Hills. That's then a known, good area. Uh, it's a really big area. Then known as Rancho El Escorpion. That's also a great name. Not only is a land great, a uh, <laughs> great name too. This girl's <laughs> Which I good. don't even think there have ever been scorpions there. Like I've never seen a scorpion in the valley. I hope to God I never do. Yeah. Maybe it was different back then. It's yes. the 18th century. Yeah. We hunted them into sorry, extinction. 1800s. Sorry. <laughs> Get it right. We harvested all of the scorpions in the valley to make Ryan Gosling's jacket in that one movie that was filmed in the valley. It's called Drive. Yeah. It's like a one word. It's not even hard. It's not like the assassination of Jesse James by Cal Robert Ford. It's like Drive. They had sheep. They uh-huh. had cattle. They had horses. They had access to limestone. They had a mall built by Rick Caruso. <laughs> Odon or Odin owned this land and ran it alongside a spirit whose husband, Jose Antonio Menendez, and their son, not the last Menendez to live in Calabasas, <laughs> and their son Juan and Odon's brothers, Manuel and Urbano, also owned part of the land that was given to them by the Mexican government in 1845, which was a rare thing for a native to have gotten land 
granted by the Mexican government. Like, they did not do that. Right, right. Except for this, really. Even rarer was a big Basque man trying to have it all. So there's two stories of how Miguel and Espiritu met. One is that Jose, her husband, was already dead, and the two met one day while Miguel was herding his sheep in the area where the two plots of land, I guess, met. Yeah. And they were like, you know, like Romeo and Juliet <laughs> on the other sides of the fence. The other story is that one day Miguel saw two guys whipping a guy, so he beat them off of him, and the man he saved turned out to be Jose, Espiritu's husband. And and in repayment for saving him, he gave Miguel all of his livestock and also his son and wife. Oh my God. Who he claimed he won in a card game anyway. <laughs> so the, these are the two versions of the story. I'm giving you something that you already said that you won. When I arrive home, the first thing I see shall be yours. <laughs> Give me that cloud. He's, he's calling ahead. Uh, hide inside. Yeah, hide. Uh, put, put like an old tomato outside. Put my ma- mannequins out front, yeah. <laughs> so whatever really happened, Jose was eventually dead and Miguel ended up marrying Espiritu. They lived on his land and Miguel was a jerk immediately. He was constantly drunk and he was very cruel to Espiritu who he treated more as his servant than his wife, right. which is, this is what uh, Cece DeVere's story was about. Yeah. They had a daughter, Marcelina, together who he actually loved and made sure got an education and everything she ever wanted. Mm-hmm. But as for Espiritu's son from her previous marriage, Miguel hated him and wouldn't let him inside the house and made him sleep in the barn. Right. Ostensibly, this was because he hated him for being lazy because he caught him sleeping on the job once and tied him up by the ankles and dragged him down a hill but more likely is because he probably didn't acknowledge him as part of his family and probably hated people who weren't Basque. Yeah. uh, Including his wife. Which is weird to think that since he married a native woman, but not so weird when you know about his goal of founding an empire and gathering as much land as possible to do so and that Mm -hmm. he saw Espiritu as an easy way to get a lot of land. Yeah. So this was all around 1860. He didn't own Rancho El Escorpion yet, but a few years later, the U.S. government finally turned its Freemason eye on the San Fernando Valley and appraised Miguel's land and found that actually where Miguel was living was technically public land. And he didn't own it at all. This was the opportunity he was waiting for. So protect his precious dirt, Miguel drew up a new land deed under Espiritu's name and also expanded the boundaries of what he owned by convincing Espiritu's dad to include his Rancho El Escorpion to protect it from the U.S. government in what was going to be deeded Espiritu's land and by proxy Miguel's land. Right, right. So he was like, look, I'm about to con the U.S. government. How about you give me all your land? Just yeah. say all your daughter owns all this. Your daughter, my wife, my wife, no. owns all this. Put it in this. It'll be protected from the government. Trust me, I'm yeah. back. <laughs> Trust me, there's no cliffs around here. <laughs> So all parties agreed to this, and after some negotiating with Odon's brother to get their land as well, Miguel Leonis now owned pretty much the Western Valley and beyond, and he had no intention of sharing it or giving it back to its rightful owners. This was his land now. Right. To make sure he was well within the new boundaries of his land, Miguel and Espiritu moved into what is now known as the Leonis Adobe in okay. Calabasas. It's still there, mm-hmm. which was originally built in 1844, they believe, as a stagecoach stop along the El Camino Real. Oh. And from this, the original Calabasas mansion, he ran his burgeoning empire. Okay. He raised sheep, he grew wheat, he sold wool. Uh, that all kind of rhymed, and I didn't even... <laughs> he mined limestone. Well, how did that all... How did I <laughs> just rhyme everything? <laughs> You're Charles Bukowski. Oh, my God. Why do I have so much acne? <laughs> but what he really loved was land, and thanks to the vagueness of the homestead laws, he was able to make questionable land grabs all over the valley. Right. His method was to just expand his livestock onto land that wasn't his, build a shack on it, and have one of his vaquero workers live in that shack and claim them as his tenant. Okay. Okay. So if people ever said, like, whose land is this? He'd say, well, it's mine because this is my tenant and I'm the landlord. Right. The landlord. The emperor of land. The, the lord of the, the land. land emperor. Yeah. <laughs> I'm land emperor and you owe the rent on the first of the month. <laughs> One of these shacks was apparently used by a friend of his for the night when he was hiding out from the law, <laughs> Joaquin Murrieta. <laughs> oh, a different. A different. A different. Not to Bercio Vasquez. Yeah. A more notorious. This was questionable, but not entirely sleazy. But we wouldn't be talking about Miguel Leonis in this episode if he were questionable, but not entirely sleazy, <laughs> Greg. Sometimes the surrounding land he wanted was already being lived on, slash, how you say, owned by somebody else already. Ready, but that wouldn't stop Miguel Leonis. Of course not. Intimidation was his favorite thing to do. All of the surrounding aspiring homesteaders from Mexico, Spain, France, Germany, and the U.S. in the Valley were fair game to him mm-hmm. if he wanted their land. He would strongly suggest people move away, and when they didn't, he'd resort to things like one of the long list of things I'm about to go through that he did to try to get people to move. Okay. He'd cut neighboring fences and have his animals stampede through oh their property. God. <laughs> there was a woman named Mrs. Mountain who he gathered 
galloped his longhorn cattle at to chase her back into her house. Wow. There was another lady named Mrs. Straussbinger who he would chase with a butcher knife whenever he saw her. Oh, that fun little game they play. But And this is all women, by the way. Like, yeah, for sure. He's the type that's like... <laughs> well, in, in France, it's more accepted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And France is part of their tradition and culture. I love France and I love the people of France. And what a- Well, look, as, when I used to live in France, so I would <laughs> I would threaten a lot of women. This is like when somebody wants to break up with their significant other... They just start a bunch of fights so they can, this isn't like normal. This is like, well, yeah, he, he didn't like, I'm not stealing your land. You're breaking up with my yeah, land. You're bra- I, yeah. You, you fled. Yeah. So he once tried to force the Garnier family off my beloved Rancho Los Encinos, AKA the duck pond yeah. by burning down their wheat fields and beating up their farm workers. And he wasn't alone in doing this. His employees, <sighs> the vaqueros who he would install in the different shacks around his land. In addition to tending that land and being a legal excuse that he owned the land yeah they were also sort of a private militia like this was his army there were about a hundred of them who he could count on to help him intimidate and abuse anybody he wanted in this sense he was really he was like a feudal lord in the western valley yeah and that really came in handy in 1875 in what is now hidden hills when a group of 30 union army civil war vets tried to settle the area to start a new life a quiet new life which miguel was not having (laughs) they refused to leave and wouldn't give in to miguel intimidations and that led to a two week long mini war between the civil war vets and Miguel's oh militia. God. <laughs> Finally, no more war. We're going <laughs> west. There were several bloody gunfights until one day the vets leader Andrew Banks was killed in the battle and the rest of them just gave up and left. They're like this is like what this are we doing? Dumb. Yeah. Miguel had these followers but none of them liked him. Okay. It, in fact, they hated him. They seemed to hate him but they were also afraid of him so they did what he said. Okay. This is why he went by Don Miguel and was called by others El Basque Grande or the King of Calabasas. And because of that, stories and legends start to circulate around around him. There's, like I said, the one of him beating up a a, uh, cryptid in Elizabeth Uh Lake, the devil's pet. Others said he could catch, bind, and lift a cow onto a cart all by himself. There's one story of a bull getting loose around Olvera Street, Uh and it started running at a woman in a red dress, of course. So he jumped in front of it, grabbed it by the horns, and twisted it onto its back and broke its neck with his bare Oh my God. (laughs) Just another that's why they recreate that every year at Olvera Street. His employees said he ruled over things like King Solomon and always knew when somebody was lying. One time, one of his workers' watch was stolen. So he demanded whoever did it to confess. Of course, nobody did it. So he lined up all the men and he brought out a donkey. <laughs> And he told all of them to go up to the donkey one by one and whisper into its ear if you stole the watch or not. Okay. So all these men went up to a donkey and said, I didn't do it. Uh, He then took the donkey aside and (laughs) pretended to have a conversation with it for several minutes. And then he went up to the men and he said, well, the donkey told me who stole it. Is this, (laughs) it sounds like a scene from Andy Griffith. (laughs) It sounds like something Barney would do. (laughs) He was trying to teach Opie a lesson. (laughs) And by Opie, I mean every single person in the Valley. This is like uh, Barney watches a John Wayne movie. (laughs) And the the whole week he's like, I know how to figure this crime out. (laughs) This is what the Duke would do. (laughs) So he he said, the donkey told me who did it. And if the watch isn't returned by tomorrow, there will be punishment. The next day, the watch was returned. (laughs) All kinds of watches were there. (laughs) This isn't the watch that's sold, but if you just want to watch. It's not even watches. It's like, take out, here's my shoes. Use the concept of time. I don't know. I didn't know what to bring. I didn't have a watch. And the donkey's just nodding. (laughs) Yes. I knew all along. Yeah. This is how we come up. But when intimidation and stealing didn't work, Miguel would resort to his next favorite thing to do, which was suing people. Oh, cool. A a litigious thug. He was involved in over 30 land-related lawsuits, including against one of the Sepulvedas. He usually didn't win, but he did his best in the form of taking judges and lawyers out to dinner and convincing them to throw away the evidence and take his side. And also he would threaten witnesses. Oh, great. One time he was watching a parade downtown and in the parade he saw a horse that he said was stolen from him. So he ran up to the horse and said, this is my horse. And he took this guy to court. And his claim was that he could prove it was his horse because this is such a weird story. There was a piece of gold stuffed into the fat of the horse's neck. Uh And if he could bring the horse into, this is another Andy Griffith thing. (laughs) If he could bring the horse into the courtroom and cut its neck open, they would find this piece of gold. And they did. And the gold was in there. (laughs) 
Did you care more about the horse or the gold? <laughs> Apparently it didn't kill the horse because it was just like fat, but like they still slit a horse's throat and reached in and pulled out a gold nugget. Do all horses have gold in it? That's where gold, it's like an oyster with a pearl. You got to slice Someone needs a- to tell the Spanish when they come looking for gold that <laughs> they're bringing it with them. Just re- the gold was in your horse's neck all along. The gold was the horses you rode the entire time. <laughs> and isn't that just a beautiful lesson? <laughs> How about you get out of here on the horse you rode in on because it's filled because with it's the gold, filled with gold you're and you're for. just wasting your time. So in 1882, he got to combine his love for violence and litigiousness when two guys <laughs> were squatting on land he felt was his. Uh-huh. So he physically tied them up and brought them to jail and accused them of burglary. Jesus. They ended up being released and he had to pay them $14,000. That, that's a thing. He was not good in court. Right, 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 he right. lost most of his cases. But he had the bravado to be like, uh, the, the law's on my side because I had a thought. Because <laughs> I'm a criminal. I- he also got into another legal battle with an equally sleazy woman named Anna Leffingwell. Mm-hmm. She had come to Calabasas from San Francisco in 1885 to marry a man who mysteriously died and she inherited his land. So she then married the landowner next door who also mysteriously died a and she inherited widow. his land. Yeah, uh, There were a lot of black widows there. No scorpions, but a lot of <laughs> Black black widows. Widows. She would keep any animal that wandered onto her property and anyone who came to try to get their animal back, she would aim her shotgun at. <sighs> Uh, she would also pretend to limp down the road just so people would pick her up to give her a free ride. Oh, I love this woman. <laughs> but in 1888, she was in a lawsuit against Miguel demanding $5,000 saying that he had destroyed her property with his stampeding cows. Mm-hmm. And when she asked him to stop, he called her, quote, bad names and then pushed her on the ground while his soldiers kicked her. I don't know why these two didn't team up and just like, let's, you know what? We can be king and queen yeah. of the worst part of the world. <laughs> He would also loan out mortgages to people and purposely foreclose on them so that he could buy up their land cheap at auction. Uh He would also get his enemies' names printed in the newspapers for made-up crimes so that he would smear (laughs) their names. Great guy who had managed to build up 11,000 acres of land by lying and cheating everybody he ever met. And he also had an orchard downtown where El Pato now is, uh, where he allegedly kept his mistress. So I, th- I think I've proven that Miguel Leonis was a degenerate sleaze bag. So yeah. now I'll treat you to his fall from glory. Okay. These constant legal battles weren't cheap. And like I said, he usually wasn't winning them. Then in 1880s, a drought hit and his livestock started dying. And slowly the iron grip he had on the Western Valley started to loosen. His legal troubles became so desperate, he even tried to appeal to the president of Mexico for help with mm. his land claims, even though they hadn't been part of Mexico for 30 years at this point. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, and these legal and financial financial troubles were on top of his personally miserable life as well. Right. Clearly his marriage was a sham and mm-hmm. bad, but in 1880, the only person he actually seemed to love, his daughter Marcelina, died at age 20 of smallpox. Wow. This sent him into such a low place that he went into a three-day drunken stupor that culminated in him trying to hang himself on a tree in his backyard. Jeez. He was standing... Tree. He was... St- <laughs> He sued the tree. (laughs) He was standing on his horse in a noose, but his horse wouldn't move. So he just got down and sawed off the branch and anchor. And then he cut open the horse's neck and he found some gold Gold. and he was happy again. He just chewed on it for a little bit. But this whole miserable existence came to an end on September 20th, 1889. He had just won his first court case in nine years. So Mm -hmm. to celebrate, he got ridiculously drunk and still decided to make the wagon journey back to Calabasas from downtown. (laughs) When he was in the Cahuenga Pass, he, of course, fitting metaphor, fell off his wagon and had his torso and head run over by the wheels. He was discovered dead the next morning. Wow. That's how Mikel Leonis died. I guess before you can get drunk and pass out on the train tracks, that's the way to go. Leave your wagon keys with your friend yeah. next time you want to. <laughs> this horse is too drunk. That day, Espiritu son moved into the house with her and I imagine everybody in the valley started singing Ding Dong, the witch is dead. <laughs> I read that there literally were celebrations all around the valley Jeez. that night because he was just he hated like yeah. he was a bully, a bully. No, he made everybody fearful for their land yeah. and there was like it was just a bad guy wow. he was remembered as a litigious basque sheep owner and many people saw him as the squatter on all the land which was which he was yeah this was not his land there was a service for miguel at saint viviana downtown near little tokyo it's still there and was buried downtown at first next to his daughter but it was eventually moved in 1932 hell uh <laughs> to the calvary cemetery in east la <laughs> but his legacy was so negative and 
overpowering that it had a long impact. For Calabasas itself, with Don Miguel, the king of Calabasas, gone, it created a power vacuum of sorts, and the whole place just erupted in Old West violence. Jeez. With all this new land up for grab, it created tons of land disputes that led to revenge killings, vigilantism, and cattle rustling all throughout Calabasas. The justice of the peace was paying, just like Andy Griffith, he was paying assassins to kill people oh for him. Oh my god. Apparently in a saloon fight, one guy had his eyes gouged out and his nose and ears bitten off. God. Which I didn't know that Mike Tyson lived in Calabasas. <laughs> Between 1890 and 1900, there were seven murders and dozens of assaults in Calabasas, which might not sound like a lot by today's standards, yeah. but there were probably like nine people living in Calabasas yeah, yeah. at the time. The population of Calabasas today is like 22,000. So uh, literally, it was probably like 100 people. Jeez. <laughs> it became known as the most lawless locality in the county. It's so funny that it's a Calabasas. I know. <laughs> All we need is Rick Caruso <laughs> to shape this place up. The lawyer Horace Bell, who was a constant adversary and occasional ally of Miguel Leonis in court, described Calabasas saying, inhabitants killed each other off so steadily that a human face is a rarity. <laughs> Uh, which I don't even know what that means. Me it, that's like more poet. This is Bukowski. Right they didn't there. have faces? Angels with no faces? <laughs> Les you <use> sans visage? <laughs> I mean, that guy got his use gouged out. Yeah. <laughs> so they have no eyes and no With face? No, without a face? Like that Dick Tracy villain? <laughs> but amongst those most closely affected by Miguel, there was just as much calamity. When he died, Miguel Leonis was either the third richest person in California or one of the 10 richest men in LA. I mm -hmm. read both of them. Either way, this Basque had money. His nephew, Jean Baptiste, also went on to found the city of Vernon. Oh, wow. Okay. But that's not part of the story. Right. When Miguel died, his estate was estimated to be worth, in today's dollars, almost $10 million. Of all this, to his wife, Espiritu, the woman who he didn't actually seem to like and had pretty much stolen her family's land and neglected her son, mm -hmm. he left all the furniture they owned and $10,000. Cool. <laughs> 5000 in cash, 5000 in a trust, quote, to prevent her from being reduced to pennies during her lifetime by reason of her ignorance and inexperience. Oh, you found a way posthumously <laughs> from, the grave. from the grave to rag me. That's great. His tombstone is just says, I hate my wife. <laughs> the rest he left to his family back in France. Why and how, you ask? Because Dirtbag from the On the Grave over here claimed in his will that she was not his wife, but rather his faithful housekeeper. Oh my He denied God. that she was ever his wife. He even went to go even further in the will to say that she would only get even what she was promised if she didn't contest the will. Oh so, of course, God. she contested the will. Yeah. She hired Horace Bell and future U.S. Senator Stephen Mallory White to represent her in court, and the mud immediately started flying. There was doubt cast on the relationship between Espiritu and Miguel, even though they had sworn in court in a previous case that they were married. The problem was that their marriage ceremony was a keech ceremony, so there wasn't official documentation mm. recognized by the current government. Right, right, right. There were allegations about her dating a younger guy since Miguel died, which I don't get why that was really an issue. <laughs> there were rumors that her son Juan was actually riding on the wagon with Miguel that night and might have actually pushed him off the Whoa. wagon. They brought their daughter's tombstone, like we talked about, into yeah. the courtroom to prove that they were married, because it's on it that she was their daughter. It was a scandalous trial, not least of all because Espiritu was a native woman fighting for property from her dead white husband, which was unheard of at the time for several reasons. Several reasons yeah. <laughs> the case lasted five weeks, and after less than a day of deliberating, she won, which oh, made right. her the first American woman to win a palimony suit, which means compensation between what was considered an unmarried couple. Right, so okay. she was the first woman in the United States history to win that. Wow. But the victory was fleeting because over and over, court cases came at her over the ownership of her land for the next 15 years. Yeah. And at the same time, she did get swindled by some con artists and lost a bunch of money and land. And even her lawyers were taking half of her court winnings Jeez. for payment. Great. But in the end, she lived on that land that was rightfully hers until she died in 1906. And she's buried at the San Fernando Mission. Her son, of course, inherited the land. But after some bad financial decisions, he lost it on May 25th, 1922. This was the last time the land of Calabasas was owned by native ownership okay. ever. <laughs> That's where it ended, and it was bought by Lester P. Agora of Agora Hills. Oh, wow. Then on November 10th, 1931, it was bought by the Spinx Realty Company, and the Leonis Adobe was turned into a sanitarium. May 1st, 1950, it was sold to the Hidden Hills Corporation. Then in 1957, it made its way into the hands of the Woodland Hills Building and Finance Company, uh, who were going to tear it down to build a supermarket. For a while, it was part of the Warner Brothers Ranch, and apparently the last person to live in that house 
John Carradine. Oh my God, really? <laughs> Dracula himself. <laughs> uh, then on August Dracula 6th- Dracula? Billy the Kid versus Dracula? <laughs> it's the perfect place. <laughs> if you're going to find Billy the Kid and Dracula, it's going to be in Calabasas. <laughs> then on August 6, 1962, the Leonis Adobe became Los Angeles Historic Cultural Monument number one, and then a museum in 1966. So ends the legend of Miguel Leonis. Wow. A type of man who I wish died for good in the late 1800s, but seems to never quite go out of style, especially in Calabasas. Yikes. 